1st August 1943, Libya. The crews of 178 heavy bombers of the 9th American Army Air Force prepare for a seven and a half hour journey to attack the German occupied city of Plaeshti in Romania. Located in the foothills of the Transylvanian Alps, Plaeshti serves as one of the most important sources for all of Germany's petroleum needs, and without it, Germany's mechanized war machine will surely grind to a halt. Called Tidal Wave, the second raid on Plaeshti is directed at the city's massive oil refineries. The first strike, launched on 11 June 1942, was wholly unsuccessful. Indeed, the main result of that raid was an increase in German anti-aircraft defenses in the area. 50,000 German troops and several hundred anti-aircraft guns are now located in and around the city. Unfortunately for the bomber crews, Allied intelligence has failed to accurately appraise Plaeshti's increased anti-aircraft capabilities. And as a result, planners have devised tactics for attacking a lightly defended target. The approach to Plaeshti varies from the Allied bombing tactics in use over Germany. The bombers over Hamburg and Essen released their loads from an altitude of several thousand feet in an effort to avoid anti-aircraft fire, while those at Plaeshti are to be released from below 100 feet. This technique should yield remarkably accurate bomb placement. The mission is plagued with problems from the start, with one of the bombers having crashed on takeoff and several others turning back due to mechanical difficulties. Over the Mediterranean, the plane carrying the assault's lead navigator crashes into the sea, leaving the force in the hands of a less experienced navigator. Approaching Plaeshti, Mission Commander General Utzel Ant, mistrusting the replacement navigator, mistakenly directs the liberators toward the city of Bucharest, 35 miles south of the target. Even after realizing their navigational error, the pilots are too busy avoiding flak to immediately correct their heading. Once on approach to Plaeshti, the B-24s encounter their stiffest resistance yet. Undaunted, the pilots sweep in low to drop their bombs as precisely as possible. The increase in accuracy, however, comes at the price of increased exposure, not only to enemy fire, but also shrapnel from explosions on the ground. As a result, many bombers are blown from the sky. Those following the first wave find their job complicated by the dense smoke rising from the burning oil. And those planes which survive the fiery gauntlet intact fly straight into a swarm of waiting German fighters. Fighting past the Luftwaffe, many of the surviving crews land safely in Malta, Sicily, Cyprus, and Turkey while others limp just far enough away to crash and sink into the Mediterranean. By the end of the mission, the Air Force counts 579 men dead, wounded, captured, or missing. As the people of Ploiesti spend two August fighting fires and diverting their oil production to undamaged refineries, it seems the tidal wave's impact is going to be short-term at best. While the limited damage to Plaeshti may necessitate further airstrikes, the sacrifices made on this mission may help save lives in future efforts to destroy Hitler's oil. What is more important, perhaps, is the inspiration, the emotional lift their actions provide for those actively engaged in the war, as well as those on the home front. The bravery and self-sacrifice exhibited by these men who flew into a flaming, bullet-ridden hell, knowing full well they might never fly out of it, stands as a symbol of their fighting spirit and will shine like a beacon of hope for those at home as well as their brothers in arms. We begin with an armada of American B-24 bombers having taken off from an airfield in North Africa, flying 1,200 miles at treetop level toward a crucial target in Romania. 
August 1st, 1943, 177 American B-24s built to bomb at high altitudes coming into the target at 30 feet. The single richest target in Europe lays before them. They hope to win it by surprise. They hope to be on it before the enemy can organize his defenses. A gamble, a carefully rehearsed blow at the heart of the enemy's war machine. The objective is oil. The Romanian oil field under attack is Ploiesti. Ploiesti is a complex of oil storage depots, refineries, and cracking plants. It is the richest target in all Europe because it supplies one third of the oil needed by the German war machine. We must destroy this target. A modern army does not travel on its belly, it travels on petroleum. Ploiesti powers the German army. On August 1st, 1943, our tactics called for a single surprise raid against the oil fields. The airmen approaching this target had seen an intelligence film based on reports by our agents in Romania and on captured documents. Now, a portion of the actual briefing film. The defenses are nothing like as strong here as they are on the Western Front. The fighter defenses at Ploesti are not strong, and the majority of the fighters will be flown by Romanian pilots who are thoroughly bored with the war. The anti-aircraft defenses of Ploesti are estimated at 80 heavy AA guns and 160 light AA guns. These again have largely been disposed for a night attack coming from the south along the railroad. The heavy ACAC should not trouble you at low altitude. All the anti-aircraft guns are manned by Romanians. And so there's a pretty good chance that there may be incidents like that there were in Italy at the beginning of the war when civilians could not get into the shelters because they were filled with anti-aircraft gunners. Reports have been received that machinery for making smoke screens has been installed. The smoke screens have not, however, proved successful against daylight attacks. Now, the defenses of Ploesti may look formidable on paper, but remember, they are manned by Romanians. At low altitude, everything goes by in a hurry. You even think in a hurry. And I remember thinking on this run-in, we could have taken more gas and left the parachutes. All a parachute is, is weight at this altitude. We wouldn't have time for it to open. These planes have traveled 1,200 miles from Africa. We were gambling. We didn't have the strength for a major attack. Perhaps a sudden raid, a thrust with a light force would win Ploiesti with a single blow. But navigation at a low altitude is difficult. And something went wrong. The first group had reached this point one half hour before it was due over Ploiesti. The run up to the target was to begin here at Floresti. But the lead group made a navigational error and turned short at this point. And unfortunately, it began a run on Bucharest. Bucharest was the headquarters of the German Air Defense Command. As the planes ran toward Bucharest, there was a moment of indecision. Then radio silence was broken and the lead plane was informed of its error. The group was approaching the outskirts of the city. The element of surprise was lost. The Germans were warned. Only one target in the area was worth the effort, Ploiesti. The Germans sounded the alert. It was answered not by second-rate Romanian flyers, but by some of the best pilots in the Luftwaffe. The German anti-aircraft artillery moved into action. All surprise was lost. German flak was waiting and ready. The first wave belatedly turned towards Ploiesti and approached from the most heavily defended direction.
some planes of the first wave were forced to bomb targets not assigned to them. When we came in, we saw it. We'd timed it just wrong. The delayed action bombs of the first wave were going off ahead of us and under us. We went out after targets and hit them on the button. In spite of delayed action bombs going off below us, flak, small arms, everything but slingshots, we barreled through and unloaded. Twelve of my outfit went into the smoke. Only nine broke out on the other side. A B-24 will climb on three engines and limp on two. When you have to feather one of the propellers, that's a sign you're already crippled. The German fighters will try to finish the kill. There's nothing you can do but try to keep your place in formation. Hope you'll be lucky. Engine planes are American. The single engine are German. You are looking at American planes in pictures taken from German gun sight cameras. We are losing a third of the men and planes sent on the mission to Gleesti. The victorious German fighter pilots buzz their own field. lost the element of surprise, although we suffered heavy losses, although some bombs fell wide at the target, still American bombers destroyed 40% of the cracking capacity at Ploiesti. The raid on Ploiesti was the only single action in the war for which five Congressional Medals of Honor were awarded. A limited action on a limited scale, the first blow to Ploiesti was not a decisive one. We had planned eight raids, but after this one, we did not have the strength to go back. Though the target burned, it still stood. The Germans marched 10,000 slave laborers into the oil fields and began rebuilding Ploiesti immediately. Our bombing produced a high degree of damage but within six months, the cracking capacity of Ploiesti was back to normal. We would have to find another way to destroy it. Eight months later, we called for another strike against Ploiesti. Now we launched another raid from our newly won air bases in Italy. The target still stood. We tried another way to get it. A single raid, larger, stronger. New tactics, fighter cover, part of the way in. The American specialty of high altitude precision daylight bombardment. We had improved. The Germans had improved too. Their radar screen was more complete. Enemy anti-aircraft had increased in density and accuracy. Enemy fighter strength had risen considerably. Pilots had been brought down from the Western Front. They were experienced and good.
Christy flying into the rising sun. We came home flying into the setting sun. The sun was in your eyes on your way in and on your way out. And that's where the fighters like to come from, out of the sun, so you can't see them. They like to make a pass from in front of you, where you have less guns and where they hope to knock out the cockpit. This day, about 250 jumped us. This is a B-17 under attack. Its left wing tank is on fire. The left side of this B-24 is disintegrating. Again, these are films taken from German cameras. The tail surface of this B-17 has been shot away. Over the target, the Germans added the last obstacle, flak and smoke. Smoke from 2,000 smoke pots drifts over Pleiasti. Drifts, clouds, obscures the target. There was nothing to do but drop our bombs into the smoke and hope by some chance they hit the refinery below. As the smoke blew away, the flyers saw that they had sent many of their bombs into the fields and farms surrounding the oil refineries. Though the target burned, it still stood. We would have to find yet another way to destroy it. We had to get under the smoke. We went back to the tactics of the first raid, back to low-level bombing and a surprise attack. But instead of heavy bombers, we would try to do it with fighters. P-38s with 1,000-pound bombs strapped below a wing. They buzzed the Balkans, climbed for altitude. They stripped their wing tanks and went in, dive bombing. Pleasty burned, but 30% of the planes did not come back, and the target still stood. Pleasty stood and shipped its oil to the German fighting machine. If we wanted this target, we had to find still another way to get it. We had to find another way to use air power. The trouble was there were only so many bombers, and everyone wanted them for a different purpose. The British wanted to wreck the Continental Railroad net. The ground forces wanted the bombers to support their plans for the forthcoming invasion of the continent. The Air Force itself was split. Some officers wanted us to concentrate on fighter factories and ball bearing plants in order to defeat the German Air Force. But in June 1944, the decision was made. In spite of German opposition, in spite of opposition from some Allied officers, we would make oil the primary target of the Air Force. Not by sneak raids or one-time shots, but by mounting a siege. Only in this way could such an extensive target be destroyed. We would mount whatever planes we had and fly day after day over the oil refineries. Now we went out in strength, knowing the Germans waited in strength. We would take what we had to take from flat. P-38 
Each black smudge is a sphere of exploding steel some 20 yards across. The Germans were accurate. Sometimes they aimed directly at the planes. Sometimes they threw up a box barrage and let the planes fly into it. we had to take from flak, and when the flak stopped, the fighters came in. We would take what we had to take from them. B-17 is out of control and on fire within the fuselage. It starts to spin in and then explodes. No parachutes. B-24 on fire, 10 men aboard, count the parachutes, one, two, we had to take and give what we had to give in prisoners in broken airplanes in wounded men chopped from the wreckage they had to take. Some men gave everything they had to give. It was expensive, but Ployosti was toppling. We had come to knowledge only combat could teach. Now long-range fighters were available, able to accompany the bombers all the way to the targets and all the way back. These are German planes seen from American gun sight cameras. radar bomb site could see the ground through the smoke. We sat over Plyesti day after day and dropped ton after ton. We had learned that this was the only way to do it, to mount a siege and give everything we had to give. We gave Plyesti 27 million pounds of bombs, day after day, ton after ton.
year and a fortnight after the first raid, Ploiesti lay useless and prone. It burned for the last time. When this oil field stopped production, the German war machine began to run down. The death of the oil fields was, by German admission, the most powerful blow struck by the Air Force. 